hello there. I am Professor Nadine Neber. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I have brown eyes and long black hair. I'm wearing a black shirt and a blue scarf. I am Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and Global Asian Studies. I am currently serving as Interim Director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy while Professor Amanda Lewis is on sabbatical. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Associate Director of IRRPP, Yvonne Arenas, who has done quite a bit of heavy lifting to make this event happen. I wanted to let you know that we have closed captioning available. And also, please use the chat feature in Zoom to ask questions. I encourage you to ask questions, so please do. Welcome to our annual Philip Bowman Lecture, a lecture established to honor Philip J. Bowman's contributions to UIC during his tenure as director of IRRPP and professor of African American Studies. During his time at the university, Dr. Bowman was an influential campus leader and a champion of administrative accountability with regard to faculty diversity, student achievement, and issues of access. This annual lecture features scholars of race, ethnicity, and public policy who provide timely analyses of issues of critical importance to the field and to communities of color. Before we begin, I want to just take a pause to honor all the lives lost during these tough times. Given the realities of a pandemic, that has made the violence of racism, imperialism, and capitalism more apparent across the globe than ever before, the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy has invited one of the most thought-provoking thinkers of our times, Dr. Vijay Prashad, to remind us how the issues that are mobilizing more and more people in the United States to address racism and injustice are indeed global in scope and require a global analysis. And to help us broaden our understanding of injustice and the possibilities for hope, social change and transformation. I will now introduce two individuals who will provide the introduction for our event. Thamal Alawala and Ash Stevens, both of whom have been inspiring our campus community at UIC to take more and more seriously the ways local and global forms of institutionalized violence from prisons and police to militarism and war permeate our lives and our labor on our campus. And they've also inspired us to think about what we can do about it. It is my honor to introduce Thamal Alawala, PhD student in anthropology working on gender sexual materialities and neoliberalism in Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan diasporas, and Ash Stevens, PhD student in law, criminology, and justice, working on gender policing and surveillance of trans, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people. So let us welcome Thamal and Ash, who will introduce our speaker, Dr. Vijay Prashad. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. This is Tamal Lavali here. Um, I am a short brown person wearing black glasses, a uh, black top, um, and I guess bronze dangly earrings. Um, and Ash. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Ash. Uh, I'm a black person with glasses, long hair, and a, and a messy beard. Um, appreciate you all being here. So we're gonna introduce um, Dr. Vijay Prashad, um, who is a historian, a journalist, a commentator, and a public intellectual. Um, he's also the executive director of Transcontinental Institute for Social Research. And he was also the George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian History and a professor of international studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut from 1996 uh, to 2017. Also in 2013, through 2014, he was the Edward Said Chair at the American University of Beirut and has been a senior fellow of the Ismam Faris 
Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs in Beirut. Dr. Prashad is the author of 30 books, uh, including Washington Bullets, Red Star Over the Third World, The Karma of Brown Folk, The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, and The Dark Nations, A People's History of the Third World, which was the winner of the best nonfiction book by the Asian American Writers Workshop and the Muzaffar Ahmad Book Award in 2009. He has served as the chief correspondent for Globetrotter, a columnist for Frontline, and chief editor of Leftward Books. Dr. Prashad is a co-founder of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, an international movement-driven institution focused on stimulating intellectual debate that serves people's aspirations with offices based in four countries, in Buenos Aires, um, Johannesburg, New Delhi, and Sao Paulo. So over the summer, the Abolition at UIC Collective um, started organizing together as we all saw uprisings spring up and be reignited across the globe in the face of various forms of state and political repression, uh, with backdrops of anti-Black violence from policing and militarism to resistance efforts um, like the decades-long struggle to protect the sacred lands of the Manua Kai uh, by Native Hawaiians to the xenophobic attacks on international students um, by the US federal government and to a report um, from just two days ago um, that the Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, in my home state in Georgia is carrying out forced sterilizations on people caged in detention centers. This and much more is under the context in which a group of folks began to shape the abolition at UIC Collective um, that Thamal and I are a part of. So it's just two uh, of the several co-organizers of that collective. Um, Thamal and I are really excited that Dr. Prashad is giving the annual Philip J. Bowman lecture today, as his work really challenges us to think deeply about our struggles for an abolitionist future at UIC as connected to similar struggles globally. Dr. Prashad is internationally recognized for his analysis of the failure of US social movements to engage with ideas originating from other parts of the world. And during the Arab uh, Spring uh, revolutions, for instance, his pioneering analysis came out of his understanding of the connections between struggles against dictators in places like Egypt and Mexico. So this analysis and documented uh, histories of transnational and multiracial alliances um, in Dr. Prashad's work have really put, uh, excuse me, have really presented a, a call to action within US social movements, including those on our campus. Uh, and I have to shout out here um, the UIC students uh, for Justice in Palestine, who's hosting an event, a virtual event next Wednesday and Thursday on Black and Palestinian solidarity um, that Abolition at UIC and other groups are co-sponsoring. Um, and more deeply than just co-sponsoring an event, um, how do we learn from and with movements for liberation um, that also seriously interrogate militarism, imperialism, empire, and war? And how do we as student organizers, but also organizers on our campus who may not be students, connect our asks and our demands of the UIC administration um, to liberatory fights in ways that are not US centric. So uh, Dr. Prashad's work pushes us to understand these connections um, and to go beyond just the theoretical and uh, instead to drive us towards building more coalitions and more rigorous study. And in keeping with all of these themes, Dr. Prashad's work with the Tricontinental Institute reveals why knowledge production matters to social movements while developing research themes with social movement partners and intellectuals in the regions where they have their offices. The Tricontinental Institute affirms that narratives about world events directly impact uh, and change, uh, changes the world economy and politics, as well as the consciousness of the working class, uh, which in turn has shaped Dr. Prashad's commitment to producing new knowledge from the standpoint of political organizations and political struggle. And we really hope that his talk inspires and adds to conversations about our own relationships to social movements at UIC, Chicago, and other locations our work may take us to. Questions of how we avoid drawing an inflexible divide between our research and activism, and instead find synergies between them. Of how we treat social movements as rich theory-making sites in their own right, um, are ones that are particularly pertinent to the moment we're living in, in our institution and in this city. And as we entertain the possibility of social movements being central to our work in the academy, thereby undoing this artificial split 
that seeks to abstract the academy out of society, how do we engage with movements in ethical ways, seeking to contribute to rather than consume and exploit the labor of marginalized communities? Our own thinking on abolition dovetails with Dr. Prashad's work, particularly as we grapple with what it means to undo an institution from within. Given the deep-rooted institutional reliance on logics of surveillance, policing, and punishment, some or perhaps many of us agree that the institution must be radically reconceptualized. But this begs the conversation of how deep our commitment to abolition runs and what its limits may be. What are our attachments to the institution as employees, students, administrators, and how willing are we to rethink them? How do we prepare to do the hard work of disassembling the institution and nurturing relationships of care and communal accountability that replace police, mandated reporting, attendance policies, and more? Dr. Prashad attends to such ethical considerations throughout his work, thinking of ways to subvert institutional logics and practices. For instance, to maintain accountability between researchers and social movements, uh, Dr. Prashad's work with the Tricontinental Institute is committed to ethnographic fieldwork and challenging academic paywalls and the way knowledge is made inaccessible to the general public while maintaining an analysis of capitalism, fascism, and the possibilities for the future. Uh, for these reasons and many more that we hope to realize in the next two hours, we are so excited to welcome Dr. Vijay Prashad to UIC and to this lecture. So Dr. Prashad, the stage is yours. First, I'm, I'm very grateful to Themal and Ash for that introduction. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, I want to say, Nadine, who invited me, and Nadine and I have known each other for a while, for a, a little while, long while, not a little while, and um, well, we share something uh, very personal because we both lost a parent this year. Um, I don't know much about your father, Nadine, but I, you said he comes from Salt in Jordan. Um, I've been there, it's, on, it's a beautiful place um, on the road, I guess the old road that used to run from Jerusalem to uh, Amman. Um, and of course, uh, yes, you know, uh, well, there we have it. Uh, there's the history of colonialism um, with the Israeli occupation now even more fierce uh, than before, um, making ordinary lives so hard uh, in that part of the world. Um, you know, a taxi ride from Beirut to Jerusalem to Amman to Damascus. Uh, that should be the life that people can lead or take the bus, you know, a train, uh, a fast train between these towns. It's unimaginable. Um, so let this lecture be, uh, Nadine, uh, or not lecture, these rambles be in honor of um, the town of Salt and the people of um, the east of the Jordan River, but also the people of Palestine. Uh, so here it is. Um, I'm going to just make four different kinds of, of remarks, and they are literally four different kinds of remarks. Um, I, I want to share a little bit about what our institute does. I want to um, spend this time uh, explaining what we do and how we see things and how we build knowledge and what we think um, you know, this knowledge is for. And then at the end of this, I'm going to talk about the kind of work we've been doing during the Corona shock period, this um, pandemic, this ridiculously outrageous world that we're in the middle of. We're all bewildered and, and um, confused by, by this. No exit, right, from this. So toward the end, I'd like to talk about the research we're doing. Glad to be giving the Bowman Lecture. I've visited once before the University of Illinois in real life. I was stunned by the architecture of um, the university, but I was very pleased to go to the Hull House, uh, which is next door and is a memory of, of you know, a radical side of, of humanity in Chicago, um, almost a contradiction to the concrete architecture. Um, but I'm, I'm very grateful to be giving this lecture, so thanks for that. 
Okay, so the first part is called Dilemmas of Humanity. Now, in 2015, um, there was a conference held in Brazil organized by the Landless Workers Movement, and it was called Dilemmas of Humanity. Um, the reason the Landless Workers Movement held this conference was they felt that the left in the world was a little bit on the back foot. A little bit on the back foot. Um, you know, there was a difficulty building people's movements because the social force known as globalization had taken away from the left some of the keen strategies of the previous era. I'll give you two quick examples. As a result of what we call the disarticulation of the supply chain, you know, breaking up of a factory. If you take a, a the classic example is you take an auto factory and when you had a very large factory, say in Detroit, Michigan, the firm had to raise substantial amount of capital to build the factory, get the ginormous machines, the huge machines, hire a lot of labor, ensure a consistent supply line of supplies, you know, raw materials and so on, some finished materials that came from ancillary factories. There was a considerable investment from capital into that factory, and there was a concentration of workers, and everything essentially was built in that factory. So in that political economic location, the workers strike was a decisive instrument. Because when the workers struck in that factory, they were able to close down the entire you know, uh, production line. In other words, they were not just closing down tire making, they closed down the whole manufacture of the car. Secondly, they trapped the enormous investment by capital into that factory. So because of the scale of production in one location, because of the scale of production, the density of investment in that location, the worker strike was a decisive instrument to build working class power. The moment you disarticulate the factory, several things happen. One is monopoly capital often no longer actually produces a lot of the things along the supply chain. It subcontracts production out around the world. And the subcontractors have to raise the financing, the investment, and they take the risk, whether it's in Sri Lanka or Malaysia, whether it's in Zambia, Mexico, it's Malaysian, Sri Lankan, Zambian, Mexican, middle level capital that raises the capital from those markets, Mexican savings, Mexican borrowing and so on, to invest into that factory, not the firms in the global north. So on the one hand, the big firms don't have a risk. They, they, they cease to take considerable risk in the supply chain. They outsource risk to subcontractors. Secondly, they source goods. So you might have three different suppliers for tires. That means that if one tire factory goes on strike, they simply cut it off out of the supply chain and they rely on the other two. So what the structure of globalization had done was it weakened trade union power because now workers, the instrument of organizing in a factory and the strike had become less consequential than in the previous pre-globalization era. You know, the, the era before the production lines were disarticulated. By the way, when I talk about globalization, I just mean this period from the 80s onward. I don't mean that before then there was no global interaction. I mean this, this period. Okay, so trade union power had been considerably weakened. Second, when political power was built in a country, you know, let's say in Burkina Faso or somewhere, you, through trade union movements, through peasant movements, maybe through progressive elements in the military, you are able to come to power. You come to power, important instrument of left-wing or popular power was nationalization. 
you nationalize some of the important factories and so on. But once you disarticulate production, then if you've come to power in a small country, poor country, the, what, what are you nationalizing? You're nationalizing tire manufacturing or you're nationalizing raw material extraction. In each of those cases, whether it's a part of the whole process of production or it's raw material uh, extraction, in either of those cases, you can be cut off from the supply chain. So even the political economic you know, strategy of nationalization of production lines is taken away from workers. So workers lose both the power of the strike and the power of nationalization of the ability to delink your economy or you know link it in a different way integrate it in a different way to other economies that's taken away from you you have to integrate your economy into western capital institutions you know for instance you have to borrow um, through commercial markets that are dominated by the london group and the paris group and so on you have to um, bow your head before the international monetary fund uh, and their staff meetings and so on. They come in and they anoint you. They give you a rating based on their rating, not Fitch and Moody's, but the IMF study. You'll be able to get a certain kind of borrowing rate from, again, London and Paris groups. So this integration makes it hard for a left agenda in these countries. So it's in that context of the structural weakness of the left of people's movements and so on. And you know, there are many other things I, I'm not talking about. You know, uh, I'm not talking about the refugee crisis. I'm not talking about informalization of labor. I, I don't have time to get into a whole lot of other stuff. I just want to make the point that the reason the Dilemmas Conference was held in 2015 was to talk about the status of the left. At that conference, at that discussion of largely people's movements, one of the key things put on the table was we don't, as people's movements, as political organizations, we don't fully understand what's happening in the world today. We don't have a clear grip of the social and political dynamics today. You know, our theories are not always highly, um, you know, contemporary in terms of their understanding of actual existing capitalism and its realities and so on. So the suggestion on the table was to create a research institute that would be a research institute that emerged out of movements to address the issues of the movements. And that was the origin of the institute that um, now I direct called Tricontinental. And it's essentially a product of a conversation by political and social movements about the lack of a certain kind of, um, you know, reading of the contemporary script. What does it look like today? What is capitalism actually like? Um, how do we understand, you know, uh, inflationary pressures and what they do? Uh, how do we understand the role of evangelical religion? You know, whether it's Pentecostalism in South America or it's Tablighi Jamaat in the Muslim world, or it's the sort of madness of uh, so-called piety religions in India. I mean, there's so many of them. These have an impact on working class consciousness. How do we understand that? Do we have enough field research? Um, what's the role of this piety stuff with the rise of new authoritarian political formations? You know, Brazil, what's the link between Pentecostalism and Bolsonaro, for instance, you know? Um, how do we understand that this is as applicable to the United States? You know, this this great mythical uh, group of people uh, called the evangelicals and their relationship to the Republican Party. You know, do we have sufficient empirical understanding of why these movements have been growing and so on? So it's a range of questions uh, that needed to be explored. Okay, so uh, that was the origin. And I'm going to come back to the Institute and our understanding of research in a minute. But I wanted to read out something I'd written. This is now the second part. Um, I wanted to read this out because this is 
um, this is a way I was just playing around trying to summarize um, our understanding after about two years of how I think we would as an institution, um, you know, how we understand the world. So, so this, is, this is just a little thing I'll read out, okay? Uh, the first two lines are silly as they should be. And then I hope the rest are a little more serious. Okay. When confronted by hungry bellies, the imperialists reach for their guns. When confronted by imperialists, the hungry bellies lock arms and march forward. Even before the pandemic, life had become impossible. For the majority of the world's peoples, money had been losing its value. It became harder and harder to pay for basic things, such as shelter, food, education, and healthcare. Work had already become degraded and jobs were scarce. The pandemic made a difficult situation worse. Meanwhile, a handful of people continue to thrive. Their stock portfolios blossom, their wealth multiplies. Crises upon crises set the world on edge. The managers of the capitalist system have no answer to these crises. Their words are hollow, their theories are broken. Rather than find a way to house us and feed us, these managers build vast machineries of destruction, police forces and militaries that suffocate the life out of the working class inside the rich nations and of the working class and the peasantry in the poorer nations. If a poorer country tries to stand upright, seeks to exercise its sovereignty, a full arsenal of power is used against it, financial, diplomatic, and military power. This is known as the hybrid war. The managers of the capitalist system are quick to unholster their guns and point them at distant adversaries, drive their tanks into our lands and occupy our homes. It is easier for them to provoke war than to fill the bellies of human beings with food. They would rather inflame people with racism and jingoism than try to manage that fact that a broken system has come to rely more and more on the unpaid care labor of women, more and more on the harsh working conditions imposed on miners and factory workers. Not for these managers, their own belief in the free market. They would rather use their weapons to keep their gains than try to bargain with all the advantages they already possess. The planet is on fire, the virus is on the march, hunger stalks the land, and yet even in this mess, we, the vast majority of the people on the planet, have not given up on the possibility of a future. We hope for something better than this, a world beyond profit and privilege, a world beyond capitalism, and so a world beyond imperialism. Our hearts are bigger than their guns. Our love and our struggle will overcome their greed and their indifference. We will build a future that cherishes life rather than profit, a future of fellowship amongst peoples rather than racist wars, a future where social hierarchies are abolished and we enjoy mutual dignity. Onward then. Okay, so that's a little summary of uh, what we in our team think. Um, we meet regularly and we've developed a common understanding of the world. And, and what I read out to you is our common understanding of where we are. Now, I'm going to come back to who these researchers are in, in a second um, and why I keep saying our understanding and, and so on um, and how we position ourselves to understand the world. Um, so to get there, I want to do a little, uh, little journey a little journey through the writings of Antonio Gramsci. Last year, we published a dossier called The New Intellectuals. And what I'm going to present to you now 
you can read in that dossier. Um, it's all there already. Um, but I, I'd like to share it with you in case you haven't seen it. Um, partly because I think that there's a general misreading of Gramsci's understanding of the intellectual. And uh, we studied that uh, section of the prison notebooks, looked at it, his other, other writings. And I think we have a uh, understanding of his view that is slightly different from the conventional academic understanding. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that Antonio Gramsci was a communist. Um, he was first a member of the Socialist Party of Italy. Um, he founded the Communist Party. He was a very important member of um, the international communist movement, including uh, in the Communist International based in Moscow, in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. He was put in prison, uh, not because he was an anti-fascist, although of course that's why he was in prison, but also because he was a communist. And when he was being sentenced to prison, the judge who sentenced him said that we are throwing you in prison so that your brain will not function for 20 years. Of course, uh, Gramsci sitting in prison did have a very functional brain and he wrote you know, thousands of pages uh, of notes which were later published as the prison notebooks. Now, what Gramsci was doing in prison was not writing about what is an intellectual. He was not asking a Weberian question, you know, like Max Weber, um, what is the vocation of an intellectual and so on. That's not what he was interested in. Benedetto Croce, for instance, the Italian uh, um, liberal, well, I suppose liberal doesn't quite fit, but the lesser of the conservative intellectuals, you know, not their investment in the question. What is an intellectual? Well, an intellectual is X, Y, Z, you know, somebody who's bi not biased and, you know, is, is looks at it, things scientifically and so on. Max Weber, Max Weber, you yourself, I would like to question your, your lack of bias. Um, because after all, the way you wrote about India and religion in India depicts uh, what we might charitably call bias but perhaps more um, honestly, we would call racist. Um, even Max Weber's most famous work on the Protestant ethic um, and the spirit of capitalism, uh, where he argues that Protestantism produces this amazing capacity to save and capitalism therefore emerges out of savings. Seriously, Weber, what about the enslavement and trade of human beings across the Atlantic world? What about the plantations um, in the Caribbean? Uh, of course, Eric Williams wrote his brilliant Capitalism and Slavery after Weber had written his book, but surely Weber already knew um, about enslavement and what the plantations did. Marx knew this um, in the 1840s and 50s. If you look at Marx's writing, on um, Proudhon, on the poverty of philosophy. He writes in that text about how enslavement of human beings produces enormous advantages for capitalism. And then Weber, 1903 or four, surely you knew about what the English were doing in India, what the Belgians were doing in the Congo. Surely you knew all that. It's not a case of amnesia. You know, uh, intellectualism as a vocation, unbiased scientific scholarship. Seriously, am I seriously to take my lessons on intellectualism from Max Weber? Seriously. Um, I once had a, a class, not class really, just a series of lectures at graduate school from Ed, Edward Schills, who was a direct line from Weber and Suzanne Rudolph, who had studied with uh, that line of thinking. And I used to marvel at the way they wrote about you know unbiased scholarship and i thought wow people in power always talk about being unbiased um, it's a delight to hear them uh, and their hypocrisy so gramsci was not interested in that sort of nonsense he was interested in how is it that we as communists had not been able to produce hegemony in society hegemony politically, economically, but also culturally. 
how is it that our ideas in the battle of ideas did not triumph when after all our ideas are based in compassion in fellowship in equality liberty freedom all these good words how is it that their ideas were able to prevail and it's in that context that gramsci is asking what is an intellectual so actually there are not just two categories of intellectuals in the prison notebooks you know traditional intellectual and organic intellectual but there's a third category the new intellectual and that's what i want to talk about so let's go over what these other ones are it's a funny thing to read in texts you know in cultural studies people talk about organic intellectual like it's a good thing you know somebody is an organic intellectual wow you completely misread gramsci so what does gramsci say is an organic intellectual he argues that every class has its organic intellectual so for instance among agricultural workers or, or the peasantry or even small farmers there will be a group of farmers or small peasants or agricultural workers who have developed a theory of the work they do the world they live in somebody who understands perhaps patterns of the weather that's come to some theoretical understanding that is a very good developed sense of when is a good time to plant if the soil is humid and so on and others go to them for advice they go to them not only for advice about um, agriculture they may go to them for political advice and this person becomes the organic intellectual of their class because of on the one side their intuitions about the world the theories they built out of that intuitions their charisma their ability to communicate these ideas within their class the bourgeoisie has its organic intellectuals advertising executives neoliberal economists and so on they are organic to their class the um, neoliberal economist uh, is going to come in and is going to very smartly provide an explanation of why the poor are lazy and so on you know and uh, they provide it from the standpoint of their class um, and ex you know advertising executives and so on so that's the organic intellectual every class has its intellectual uh, it's not that you know only the peasantry has their intellectual and so on every class has their intellectual then he says secondly he makes a very important point that whereas organic intellectuals are rooted in different classes and they have to earn the respect of their classes uh, whether it's through as i said the intuition the intellectual uh, you know uh, architecture they built out of the intuition um the knowledge that they provide which sometimes could sound like wisdom you know i have an understanding of the the elements and so on and then their capacity to communicate it you know whether that's called charisma or it's called a skill at communication they are good with words and so on so every class has their intellectual so those are organic intellectuals then gramsci says that nonetheless despite the fact that every class has their intellectual and these are organic intellectuals the elite classes have a special kind of intellectual and these are traditional intellectuals these are people who by profession and by the authority of their institution are given the right to define what the world is like so gramsci talks about priests for instance a priest doesn't have to develop a special communicative function they their their authority is the pulpit that's what gives them the authority to speak you know they don't you don't have to particularly be a good speaker or charismatic you are you are you are, your authority is given by the fact that you have been placed into the pulpit and that gives you the authority similarly he talks about college professors and no disrespect to college professors but he says and i was one for a long time he says that our authority comes from the chair that we that we hold the place we sit in the classroom the students have to listen to us because we have been appointed there you don't really have to i mean yes it's good if you have a gift to speak and so on and communicate ideas but if you don't have that you still have a certain authority um and he says that's a traditional intellectual and generally they speak in the terms of the bourgeoisie typically the traditional intellectual channels the bourgeoisie's understanding of the world but doesn't channel it as the bourgeoisie's knowledge but as universal knowledge so the traditional intellectual separate from the organic intellectual doesn't speak for their class alone it speaks in 
the views of the class, but produces knowledge that appears universal. And therefore, they are able in the battle of ideas to command the field. And so Gramsci says that a traditional intellectual is often the organic intellectual of the elite who doesn't speak in a language that appears as if they are speaking only for their class, but they speak as if they speak for humanity. And that gives them an enormous advantage in the battle of ideas. They're able to speak as if they speak universally, objectively, and so on. So then the whole, you know, whole thing of objectivity is grounded by Gramsci in these class terms. He suggests that objectivity is not a scientific outcome of thinking, but in fact, objectivity is produced by the institutional location of a traditional intellectual. That institutional orientation of the traditional intellectual produces the, well, I would call it the temptations of objectivity. You're tempted to claim objectivity. Actually, that class location allows you to speak as if you speak for humanity. Um, and so that's the traditional. And then Gramsci has a whole other thing, which I'm quite surprised. So many people writing on intellectuals and Gramsci don't talk about this part of it. The third intellectual, the new intellectual, he calls the permanent persuader. He says, and then there's the permanent persuader, the new intellectual. This is the intellectual of the political party of the people. In other words, he's talking about the Italian Communist Party. He's talking about what should leadership, intellectual leadership in the Italian Communist Party look like. And there he has a very interesting observation about how research should uh, be conducted. He says that the way research must be conducted in a political party of the left is that the left intellectuals go amongst the people they listen to what the people are saying. You know, this is very much along the same grain as Marx's method of the concrete, the abstract, and back to the concrete. You must go among the people, develop a sense of what the people are saying. And it's in this context that he says, the people have developed a contradictory consciousness. They've developed a contradictory consciousness because on the one hand, they have their own understanding based on their own practical experience of life and therefore of their organic intellectuals. They have their own understanding of reality. But then overlaid on that, or in contradiction with that, or to that, sorry, are the views propagated by traditional intellectuals. So traditional intellectuals say that people are not, they're poor because they're lazy, or they're alcoholics, and so on. That's what the traditional intellectual is telling them. The priest is yelling at them on Sunday. You're lazy, you're sinners, you drink too much, you waste money like that, and so on. If only you saved and were truly like a Weberian, you know, and, and not a profligate Catholic, uh, maybe that would be good, but they wouldn't probably say that from that pulpit. So that's what they're getting on the one side. On the other side, their own experience tells them, but I work so hard and I am trying to be frugal and I simply am not making enough you know, the law of surplus value is so against me that I cannot make enough for social reproduction to take place effectively. So we are starving. We are hungry people. My own experience is telling me about hunger and, and desperation. But I'm hearing that it's because I'm a sinner. So Gramsci says the left intellectual goes into this arena, absorbs from people their contradictory consciousness. And then he uses a word which Edward Said makes a lot of in Orientalism. It says they draw in the contradictory consciousness and then elaborate common sense into philosophy. Elaborate the common sense into philosophy. You make a theory out of people's own thinking. You don't impose a theory on people. You have to draw from people what their contradictory consciousness contains. And then the new intellectual has to sort out what people are thinking and find a way to elaborate these thoughts, all of these thoughts in a certain way, and then present it back to people to see if the thought that you've elaborated resonates. Now, I want to say something. I mean, it's, Gramsci's thinking is quite brilliant. When I first read this and we discussed it and said, wow, this is very interesting, I thought immediately of Fidel Castro. You know, people make fun of Castro saying, you know, he used to give these four or five hour speeches, um, you know, and 
I would think, okay, yeah, so what's the problem? I mean, um, you have, you know, at the time, maybe six, seven million people in Cuba, and most of the teachers had abandoned the country at the revolution. What the Cuban uh, 26 July movement and then the, you know, committee to defend the revolution and so on, go deep into the lives of Cubans, understand the contradictory consciousness. Somebody like Castro and others would draw out and elaborate that consciousness and then you'd have Castro basically presenting it back to people, which is why, which is why what, when he was speaking, people were like, that's exactly what I think. You know, right on, Castro, you're right. Because you're essentially mirroring my thinking. You're not saying something so brilliant. You are the new intellectual of our revolution. So thinking about this method, we decided this is going to be the method of our work. Um, we are not going to develop a research agenda based on theory. You see, one of the things I found that was getting exceedingly troubling for me in um, the modern uh, academic environment was that students, for instance, were introduced to theory first. And based on theory, they had to find gaps or, and so on. And from theory, they would choose a topic. And then they would go to the field, almost to test their own theory. And so the subjects of work were totally tertiary, you know, right at the end. And you're, you are then just like a corporation that goes and does field trials for medicines. Uh, there, there's no difference between the way, you know, scholarly production or knowledge is created and, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies. I don't see the difference. It's structurally the same thing. You're developing thought out of your own theories. You're reading theoretical books. You're debating them in graduate school. And then you create a kind of agenda. You've never actually necessarily, I'm not saying everybody, by the way, don't misunderstand me. I'm not making a, it's obviously blanket because I'm trying to make a point. Uh, certainly there's a lot of people who don't do it like this. I'm just trying to make a point. So abide by me, abide with me, sorry. Um, I'm just trying to make a point. Um, so this approach, we thought, let's experiment with this. So in all our teams, in all the countries, in, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, in Sao Paulo, in Johannesburg, in Delhi, the people who are researchers, you see, we decided that the idea of a scholar as an activist is a very troubling idea because there is a difference between scholarship and activism. Um, there is a difference. So rather than have scholars becoming activists, um, you know, saying that my scholarship is my activism, um, each of the offices is staffed by members of political and social organizations who are also researchers. These happen to be two things that they do. They are also active people in political and social organizations, but they're also researchers and they take their research very seriously. So it's from their movement and interacting deep in the movement that the questions and the issues are put on the table. And then we go back and do extensive field research uh, amongst people in um, the class, in the key classes of our movements. And it's from there that we start developing our understanding of um, issues today. Um, you know, and I, I, so I, I'm going to pause and come to the last thing. I, I'm aware there's about 10 minutes to go. I, I just want to give you the example of what happened when the coronavirus hit uh, for our research. And I, ho I hope this is instructive in some small way, you know, for the Institute, for scholars trying to um, work on things like, um, you know, the unbelievable level of, of, uh, of repression uh, in the United States against the, the working class. Unbelievable amount of repression. Um, you know, the number of people that are shot uh, you know, I mean, the situation in Colombia and the United States and so on, these are parallel countries. I mean, it's, it's a vicious, vicious repressive apparatus that is class specific, you know. There's a big difference between the way in which different classes are treated by the police in the United States. I mean, there's a vicious attack at certain classes um, of people who are suppressed minorities and so on. So uh, I hope that some of this thinking is useful. Um, anyway, well, I, I can't help it if it's not, but at least I hope it is. 
um, when the pandemic struck, uh, when the, the virus came, um, well, firstly, it was clear to us that we saw immediately how the countries of Europe, Italy, the United Kingdom, United States, I mean, it's a joke. Uh, they didn't prepare at all. They gutted uh, health systems and so on. But we saw immediately, um, you know, within weeks, uh, our institute was in touch with healthcare workers in Vietnam, their union. Uh, we were in touch with healthcare workers in Laos. Because I was very interested why the, the rate of infection was so low in Vietnam and Laos, which bordered China, and why for a long period there was no deaths in Vietnam and in Laos, seven million people, you know, incredible. Then we saw in Cuba, by the time the pandemic came to the Americas, in Cuba, 29,000 medical students left their dormitories, went door to door and tested 11 million people in the population. And they've really done a tremendous job. In Kerala earlier, as a, a just distinction from the rest of India, the health minister, K.K. Shailja, immediately took a scientific approach and they broke the chain of infection almost. I mean, it's very hard because you're linked to India where there's a monstrous government which is doing nothing. So the first thing we thought about was these places seem to have a different arc. We did a little report first on China, Corona shock in China, where with colleagues in China, uh, I wrote a report showing that the United States government was lying about what was happening in China. That was a kind of st statement of, you know, just putting the timeline before people. Um, so that, that was slightly separate. But we did another report subsequently on Corona shock and socialism to compare uh, how the United States, for instance, or United Kingdom, Italy, France, even, um, you know, these countries, uh, then India, Brazil had utterly failed to handle um, the coronavirus. Uh, but while we were doing this research, we were going underneath and talking to nurses unions in Brazil, uh, medical workers in Brazil, in Argentina, in South Africa, in India, uh, public health workers in India. We did a survey of public health workers. We were asking them what they were doing, what their day was like, um, trying to build as much, you know, basic understanding of what it was like to go and treat people without protective equipment. I mean, basic thing, you know, how is it possible? So we were doing field research. Uh, I, I talked to a nurse just outside Sao Paulo, Juliana Rodriguez, um, brave, brave nurse said something ex extraordinary. Uh, she had for four months been in um, the trauma ward, Corona trauma, trauma ward in a hospital outside Sao Paulo and for four months hadn't seen her 11 year old daughter because she wanted to quarantine from her daughter for the whole period. I mean, these are very brave people, but they gave us knowledge. They were telling us about what it was like in their profession, what it meant to go to work every day and so on. And so we prepared a preliminary study called Health is a Political Choice, uh, which is entirely built by the, um, by the trade unions of uh, medical workers, nurses unions, um, medical workers unions, and so on. In, uh, in Argentina, one of the leaders of the union, in fact, wrote the section based on her work inside the union. And, you know, we took all the, I mean, extensive conversations with unions uh, from across these three continents, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and we built a 16 point uh, demand of what the healthcare workers uh, are wanting. Now we are working, we're going to start working on a campaign called the People's Vaccine, where we are going to work alongside, again, healthcare unions in Brazil, Argentina, actually across the South American, uh, across the, the, the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, in Southern Africa, in large parts of Asia, we're going to work with um, healthcare unions to build a campaign uh, with Oxfam and UNAIDS on the people's vaccine, uh, because we think the whole vaccine thing has been hijacked. And it's not we meaning the 36 people who work in Tricontinental. It's the trade, it's the, the nurses and the doctors and the janitors in hospitals. They believe that the vaccine must be produced free. What does that mean? It's not just about making a, a slogan. We discovered as we started doing this research that the pharmaceutical capacity is not there 
in many parts of the world. You know, remember Bill Clinton in an act of imperialist violence bombed the Al Shifa factory in Khartoum, Sudan, um, when the Monica Lewinsky story bro bro broke. They bombed the pharmaceutical factory, the only pharmaceutical factory in Sudan, um, saying it produced you know weapons or something. Total nonsense. It was an act of of absolute arrogance. Uh, well, Sudan doesn't have a proper medical, uh, sorry, pharmaceutical capacity. So now we, we are looking with our union partners at very carefully at where, you know, can people even produce a vaccine uh, for COVID-19? If you don't produce a vaccine and you have to bring it in, well, we discovered quickly enough that Korea companies don't have the refrigeration capacity to carry enough vaccines to vaccinate key populations, not everybody, key populations. That means you need to diversify the production of the vaccine. Well, we learned that talking to pharmaceutical um, employees unions, workers who work in pharmaceutical factories. We learned it from them. So we're not going to the uh, pharmaceutical owners and asking them anything because, you know, they have their own interests. They have their own class perspective. We want to build knowledge from the perspective of workers. It's a very difficult job because you're talking to lots of people spread out across many different organizations. So that's, that's the kind of project we're involved in now. Um, how do we build our knowledge? Just to summarize this and then I'll wrap up in a minute uh, so that I keep to my time. How do we build knowledge? Um, we're interested in the fact that during this pandemic, everybody knew that healthcare workers were, um, you know, everybody says essential workers and so on, but nobody really listens to them much. And especially not healthcare workers outside the West. Um, we just don't see what uh, the unions are saying. In fact, you may not know this, but the Brazilian healthcare workers unions have taken Jair Bolsonaro, the president, to the International Criminal Court in The Hague and charged him with genocide. Um, it's a really interesting, I've written about this. I, I hope you will go and read about it because the unions are very keen on getting publicity about their campaign against Bolsonaro. Um, you know, unions have things to say, but they never get uh, their voice out there in the battle of ideas because the way in which um, the battle of ideas functions hegemonically is that the traditional intellectual will speak for society. And we never allow the new intellectuals, the trade union leaders and so on to have a voice. So our institution is very much not about ventriloquism. We don't want to speak for somebody. We want to amplify the voices of our new intellectuals. We don't claim to be the new intellectuals. We are conduit uh, for the new intellectuals, which is the, um, the leaders of political and social and economic movements, um, at least in the three continents. Uh, our work is, as we say, to amplify their voices, uh, not to ventriloquize, not to speak for them, uh, but to put their views forward uh, in front of the public. And the reason we are putting their views forward and they are not is because they are too busy doing the work they do. And they have built political trust with us and said, go out there and tell people what we're saying. Um, not go out there and speak for us, but tell people what we're saying. And that's the attitude that we have taken um, in our work. It's a complicated business, this trying to change the world. Um, when Nadine asked me what will be the title of, well, this rambling, I don't know what it is, lecture. Uh, it's so awkward, friends, because I'm sitting, you know, in this room, I'm looking at the TV screen and there's Justin doing sign language. Uh, Justin happens to be above me doing sign language. Um, this is just me and Justin and I don't, can't see anybody. It's so strange doing these lectures. When Nadine asked me, said, uh, what's the title for this talk? I said, well, Nadine, what about, um, I, I've forgotten the exact title, but it's something like, um, you can't understand the world if you're not trying to change it. Um, I think that's it. You can't understand the world if you're not trying to change it. It's playing a little bit with Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, where Marx says philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to now is to change it. Well, I actually think Marx was not saying enough. Uh, he, he felt that philosophers could interpret the world. I'm suggesting something much more fierce than that, I hope, which is that you can't understand the world uh, unless you're trying to change it. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prashad. Um, it's difficult to even try to, you know, speak after 
trying to process everything that you brought to the table. You've challenged us to think in new ways about the relationship between scholarship and activism, the way we design research in consultation with social movements uh, that align with the historical moment that we're in. So I really appreciate that you, um, you know, took that call and, and uh, really thought and helped us think about what we're trying to do at UIC and especially at IRRPP in doing better in the ways that we think about scholarship in relation and consultation with social movements. You've inspired us to think about the urgent need to update our analyses of workers' struggles in the context of current challenges related to medicine, colonization of people and ideas, the histories of political and economic struggle, the university, transnational solidarity, and perhaps even dismantling, not even, but really importantly, dismantling the idea that the US is the center of the world and of our activism and of the way that we develop radical transformative thought and analyses. And I just think at this moment that we're in, both uh, in terms of all the struggles around anti-Blackness and police violence, it's easy to uh, become more narrow, which is also urgently needed on the one hand, but then simultaneously on the other, how do we remember to connect back, even in times of extreme crises or extreme moments of state violence, to really remember that US imperialism already connects us. And so it's up, us, up to us to catch up with it and remember that these connections are already there across you know, the continents, um, as you have so brilliantly shown. Uh, so it is now my great privilege to introduce Professor Todd Breland, Associate Professor of History at UIC, who will serve as our discussant. And I was just so thrilled that Dr. Todd Breland agreed to uh, follow Dr. Prashad's talk. Her urgent scholarship focuses on the history of education, Black history, racial and economic inequality, and education and urban public policy. She is author of the stunning book that I highly recommend, A Political Education, Black Politics and Education Reform in Chicago since the 1960s with University of North Carolina Press. And her writings have appeared in many journals, edited volumes and popular outlets. Professor Todd Breland is also one of the wisest and steadfast public intellectuals on our campus. She not only coordinates professional development workshops, curricula and courses for K to 12 teachers, but she also serves on the Chicago Board of Education. Just this summer, Dr. Todd Breland worked tirelessly for the struggle to remove police from Chicago public schools, inspiring many of us to think about how we can apply our scholarship more broadly and our scholarly expertise to efforts committed to social change in our city, in our communities and far beyond. So Professor Todd Breland, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's such an honor to be here today. It's such an honor to have an opportunity, although now also terribly overwhelming to speak after <laughs> Dr. Prashad, um, but I'm grateful to be here. Again, my name is Elizabeth Todd Breland. And I think uh, the best way I can think to, to begin um, my comments and thinking about this after what you just said is to make a statement of my solidarity with our colleagues and coworkers here at UIC um, who are currently on strike right now from SEIU and the Illinois Nurse Association for safety and dignity and a living wage in the midst of a pandemic. Um, one of the things that um, Nadine had asked me to do was to bring this conversation to Chicago and think about it in the context of some of my own sort of research interests and work. And one of the very provocative questions that I think um, Dr. Prashad's comments put before us is this question of where research lives. Um, who is producing research? Are they just scholars, community organizations? What does research based in community organizations look like? And that, these can, that research can come from many different places. And I think that one of the uh, things that you sort of brought up was this idea of sometimes the difficulty in just finding and accessing data and knowledge and information. And in my own research, I think of 
um, the Chicago Urban League in the 1960s and the ways that their data was used for civil rights lawsuits, but also in coordination with community organizations. And I'll just offer an example here. Um, in the 1960s, the Chicago Urban League produced reports with data showing that Black students attended overcrowded schools that were running on double shifts while there were open spaces in better resourced schools serving white students just nearby. And those in power um, who were resistant to desegregation attempted to discredit these reports. Uh, the school system itself did not maintain racial demographic data on students at the time. And it made me think of Dr. Prashad's comment that people in power always accuse others of bias, right? So that this was discredited data about these disparities. And so a black community-based organization, the Woodlawn Organization, sent a group of black mothers who they called the Truth Squads into these white schools to take pictures and document the disparities that the Urban League had been documenting in the reports they were producing. And when several of these Black mothers were arrested um, while visiting the schools, it was covered in the Black press and then became another cause for community organizers to leverage and pushing forward the movement for equitable schools. In a more recent example that Nadine uh, touched on a bit, I reflect on the movement here in the city, and I want to say that was very much led by young young people, young black people in particular, young brown people in the city, um, to get police out of schools. And that this movement to get police out of schools also was largely built on data and research produced by young people and research collectives, not produced in universities. Um, I think of organizations like Voices of Youth in Education here in Chicago that for over a decade and this summer have been producing these research studies. Um, Cops Out CPS, which was data that they garnered from multiple FOIA, report, uh, FOIA requests and other, other um, sort of subversive ways to try to get at data that's not publicly available, knowledge that's not publicly accessible. Um, I think of the, in the Invisible Institute here in Chicago that was also part of that. And this uh, tension between individuals and these collectives, because most of these um, groups work are collectives. You don't necessarily know the individuals doing that work, but there are some who you do know um, who, uh, one in particular I'm thinking about, a woman named Trina Tyler, who as a researcher is also someone who's very deeply involved in movement work and that those things are, are not separate for her, but still question this thing about scholar activists, right? That, th that her work as a researcher with the Invisible Institute is also built out of and part of her movement work. And then other organizations nationally like the Advancement Project that were putting forth this research. And with most of these, as I was sort of saying, I, I couldn't tell you the names of the people who crunch the numbers from the Urban League to these various organizations because they tend to move as collectives rather than be known as, under, as uh, individuals. But one of the things that stands out to me about this is that it seems very different from the directives of the Academy. Um, which encourages and incentivizes individual research accomplishments, even if that research is multi-author. Um, and it feels like there's something here that we can learn from that. So where does research and learning live? Uh, I think what I hear um, Dr. Prashad saying is encouraging us to continue to push and challenge the paradigms that would constrict where knowledge is produced, that would constrict who and from where that knowledge can come. Listening to Ash and Thamal in the beginning, I think abolition at UIC is an exemplar of using this research and learning from movements for liberation, for aiming to engage with movements in ethical ways. Um, certainly Dr. Prashad's work has provided inspiration here as well. Not a research agenda, um, as he was saying, based on theory, but elaborating common sense into philosophy, not making scholars into activists, but researchers who are also deeply involved in political organizations. And in that respect, I also wanna lift up the work and opportunity that IRPP does, has provided here um, for you know, researchers at the university to do this kind of research, not for, but with community organizations to try to do that amplifying work. Um, and so I was just very inspired to hear about the work of the Tricontinental Institute in this moment of these intersecting crises, producing reports on, and I love this term, corona shock, um, corona shock further exacerbating existing inequities, um, that trade unions are part of writing these reports, this idea of a people's vaccine. Um, and so I'm going to end with a couple quotes that really stood out to me from Dr. Prashad. One, um, that rather than house and feed us, the managers of capitalism create police and military forces. 
but that there is also a response to this. Um, that when encountered by imperialists, the hungry bellies link arms and march forward. How powerful that is. That our hearts are bigger than their guns. That we work for um, what you called a future that values life rather than profits. And that, to your point, you can't understand the world then unless you are trying to change it. So thank you for giving us these words of provocation, these words of inspiration um, to keep us moving forward, arms linked. Elizabeth, that was so powerful. Um, thank you so much for approaching this lecture with so much care and thought and bringing you know, your history and your analysis um, uh, and yourself to the table in this way of just uh, really not only adding, but helping us think deeply about the idea of um, scholar activist uh, both in Chicago and then connecting it back up globally and then uh, linking it to IRPP and UIC. Uh, thank you so much. Um, at this time, we're going to move to the question answer and I encourage everyone, all the participants to add your questions in the chat. Uh, we already have several questions. So I'm just gonna jump right in so we can have a lively discussion together. Uh, so, one question someone asked what vj was reading from i believe that was during the second point in your discussion vj is it a book or is it an article is it you know something that you all wrote so why don't we just start with that to get okay. our get ourselves warmed <laughs> up <laughs> so uh yeah that's uh, that's a, that's that's nice it's not a book um so you know before the pandemic we had a few over the last two years, we had a couple of global meetings where we were lucky enough to meet together. And then um, during the, the pandemic, you know, our offices are in pretty insane places like Brazil and India now is number two, just overtaken Brazil. Uh, more people um, were tested positive for coronavirus in India in one day than the total people infected in China during the whole pandemic. I mean, that's the collapse of the healthcare and economic system in places like India and Brazil. So during the pandemic, you know, in our offices, there's been real, uh, and I have to say that a number of our people are in Kerala. They're not in the worst parts of India where they're out on the streets, trying to learn what's happening and so on. Anyway, the point I'm making is um, we've had several you know, we don't always use blue Zoom. We use big blue button and other free software means to gather together. And we've had a bunch of meetings. We are also in a process known as the week of, you can go to the website. It's antiimperialistweek.org, I think. Uh, antiimperialistweek.org. It'll be held in October. The week of anti-imperialist struggles. And in this process, we've been trying to craft some kind of text that helps freeze our thinking in this moment. You know, it's a summary text of where we have reached in a common way together as researchers. And we wanted something that will make us feel good, frankly, um, because we didn't want to have a laundry list of tragedies. Um, you know, there's a Marxist philosopher I particularly like by the name of Ernst Bloch and Bloch always wrote about the importance of hope. And if you understand human history as dialectical, you know, always in motion, uh, then despair should not be the mode of your thinking. Because if you are a human being and you have the capacity to struggle, you know, you will always be struggling for something. That means history has not been foreclosed. There's always the possibility. By the way, it's like the great Lebanese Marxist, you know, Mehdi Amel. Uh, if you are resisting, you have not been defeated. Uh, that's such a great line. If you are resisting, you have not been defeated. Uh, I'll just give you another little story. I was in Buenos Aires in a, uh, the uh, Naval Museum, not museum, sorry, the Naval School, where uh, during the junta, they tortured most of the workers and the activists and the students and so on. And in the basement where they torture people, 
there's there are photographs taken by one of the prisoners of other prisoners coming in as a record you know and it's old camera so he had he took lots of still shots and then they printed the contact sheet and i saw this two pictures of this young woman possibly a student being photographed in the first photograph she's looking directly kind of directly at the camera but she looks despondent she's wearing a jumper sweater because it's winter and she's looking kind of at the camera you know she's not looking pleased but then in the second photograph because it's a contact sheet taken a split second later she puts her fist up and she looks a little defiantly at the camera and i thought there it is you know as long as you are resisting you have not been defeated we have so many millions of stories like that that we said let's write a text that's about a particular conjuncture but it must be written uh with the feeling of that woman who the first photograph she looks despairingly at the camera but then when the shutter clicks the second time she puts her fist up so that it's just a text it's not from a book or anything uh another question i'll put these two questions together um vj someone was just asking where they can read more about uh the tricontinental institute and their assessment um of the different situations you refer to and then uh, in the meantime uh here's a question for you uh, what was the relationship between du bois's and gramsci's ideas did they have interchange of ideas um and cw mills that spoke of the types of intellectuals in the sociological imagination did mills lift those ideas from gramsci well at this point nadine i will say that i haven't read everything in the world <laughs> um so i have not read c right mills sociological the sociological imagination so i i can't answer that question i'm afraid um and on du bois and gramsci i don't think they had any interaction i don't think so i i, I may be wrong um but i don't feel they did um you know gramsci was not known outside the commun communist world until the 1950s so actually in the um period when he was writing in the 20s and 30s he was writing in the communist italian press and then later in the um the comintern uh, he was known for his work in the comintern but it's not until he dies and um you know togliati and others put together the prison notebooks and it's really not until the 1970s that you know when eric hobsbawm writes primitive rebels and and so on and and then international publishers publishes the little version of selection it's not until then that he's widely known uh, you know it, it's funny you think now well everybody knew gramsci not when he was alive uh, after all he was in prison for a long time and listen friends there are people in prison today in the united states that are probably writing very interesting notebooks and nobody's nobody knows they are there and I, i will hazard that there are people who've written brilliant things in prison and i'm going to tell you about one of them just for the you know for the heck of it um but there are people who've probably written lots of things which are published and are not read i mean i've always thought that mumia abu jamal for instance is a very uh clear headed political philosopher about america um when you read mumia's regular writings uh this man who has been in a tiny cell and on death row for years a uh, crystal clear understanding of how capitalism works imperialism works this guy didn't need to be outside he somehow from his praxis you know in the black panther movement or whatever he developed a very good theory of society and you know there are people like that so gramsci was not known so i don't think there was any engagement with du bois directly and i don't i don't never seen du bois write about gramsci um but i i i'm i'm embarrassed to say i have not read c right mills but i have seen the picture of c right mills with his motorcycle <laughs> that i've seen yeah it would be great to hear you talk uh people some folks are asking about the idea of you know the the scholar activist he really provoked uh some thinking on that um someone asks that i feel it's a luxury to have an institute doing this work 
how many of those can exist? How many people can make a living in this activity? Students come to the university to graduate into a position into the status quo. To what extent can we redirect universities and students to be agents of change? So of course, any part of that you wanna take up. No, I, I like the whole question, actually, Nadine. Uh, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and so the first thing is there are lots of institutes um, of this kind, but at different scales. You know, for instance, just last week, 10 days ago, in Caracas, in Venezuela, um, was launched the Simon Bolivar Institute, uh, which will do very similar kinds of work. Um, I, I'm very close to the Jyoti Basu Research Institute in Calcutta, my city of my birth in West Bengal, India. Um, there are institutes all over the world that, uh, you know, the Workers' Party of Brazil has a research institute um, and so on. There are many that are linked directly to political movements. Um, it's not a luxury because uh, these movements know that research is vital. Um, you know, as, as I think Elizabeth said quite correctly, uh, you can't build a political campaign unless you have research, unless you know what, you know, you're, you're dealing with. If you don't know uh, your enemy, as it were, it's a too strong a word, Nadine, I don't always use the word enemy, but if you don't know your enemy, how do you build a campaign? So it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And the people who work at the research institutes are often militants, um, you know, who are tasked uh, to work in these in these roles. Uh, now the problem is, and coming back to what Elizabeth said, if I could, if you don't mind, I'd like to connect the two. Uh, yes, there is an issue uh, that we should confront directly, which is something that you know I'm thinking a lot about, which is what is the difference between making research a career and making research part of your political work. Um, you know, uh, I, this is a fair, and I'm not judging anybody. This is a political choice one makes. You know. Um, what's happened, I think, to um, university work or what's happened increasingly, all kinds of these institutional locations, is that um, there is a way in which the resources uh, have begun to, you know, swamp um, what's possible and, and what's available. You know, we complain that, you know, okay, I'm, I'm a pro-Palestinian and, you know, shit, I don't care. Uh, and then they come after you, you know, and then people complain and say, oh my God, they're coming after me. I'm pro-Palestinian. Are you kidding? Let them come after me. If they didn't come after me, I'd be surprised. You know, I'm a communist. They, oh my God, we have a communist in the faculty. I'm a communist. You want to fire me? You can fire me. That doesn't, I'll find something else to do. My job, my job is a job in an institution that is located in a capitalist structure. I'm talking about a university job. When I taught at Trinity College, every half an hour it seemed that there was a scandal about something. I called Obama an imperialist. There was a scandal. I went on national public radio and said the killing of Osama bin Laden was, um, was a violation of international law. Um, that day, uh, Bill O'Reilly called me the pinhead of the week and there were these death threats and so on. And, you know, my college lost a lot of my, my college, the college that I no longer work for, lost a lot of money and they were furious with me. And, you know, and and then why should I be outraged by this? This is a class struggle of ideas. You know, I, I said things that are against the status quo and somebody got pissed off like Bill O'Reilly. By the way, I must say for the record is I've never sexually harassed anybody unlike Bill O'Reilly. So let's put that on the record. You know, maybe I'm a pinhead, but at least I'm not, you know, and I know I can't curse on this, on as, as in this lecture, but at least I'm not like him. You know, uh, let's talk about morality, Bill. Um, you know, you, you insulted me publicly. You, you humiliated me. You came to my house. You sent Jesse Waters to my house to harass my family. Uh, Jesse Waters, you know, a gangster, a racist, uh, his shows on China, appalling appalling moral uh, fiber, but this is the battle of ideas. You know, these people are seen as normal and legitimate. And people who say things like, you can't just go and assassinate somebody is outside the boundary and illegitimate. So it's not true that this form of institution building is a luxury. In fact, all our movements have them and everybody is a militant and works to do this work not because there, there are careers being built. And I have to say the people who are in our institute are working very hard and uh, they understand that, you know, this kind of thing is, will, is you know, the, many of them have PhDs. 
It's not going to be an easy way to go back into the academy, but they're not, that's not what they're doing with their lives. They want to build research to advance our movements. And that's a, that is just a personal choice, a political choice they've made. So again, I don't want to make this into a question of judgment. People make different choices in their life. I made a different choice in the 1990s when I went into the university. Then I decided I'm not interested in this anymore. But that's a choice I made after a lot of frustration and anger. And it took me a long time to come to the, the, have the courage to say, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, it was a long journey. <laughs> And I, I'll admit to you, it's not easy. So I'm not a moralizer on these things. Uh, but I do think that there are lots of people, and I've seen them, my seniors, my, my peers, who very early on in their careers decided, I'm joining the movement as a militant, and I'm not going to have a job with a big salary and, and this and that. I'll be a militant for my movement, and I'm going to do research as a militant. And they built institutions, which we don't know about because they are rooted in political movements like the Jyoti Basu Research Institute or now Simon Bolivar Institute. You know, it, it's not like the Brookings Institution. You know, what makes Brookings and the American Enterprise Institute and all this stuff, what makes them legitimate, more legitimate than, you know, the Sundaraya Vigyan Kendra in Hyderabad? Thank you so much. You, you've gave us a, given us a lot to look up and uh, make sure that we educate ourselves on what, what sound like really um, crucial institutes doing the kind of work modeling the, the ideas that you've been uh, sharing with us. Uh, so we have several questions coming in. And just to note that every question so far before it says something like, Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, so I'll just get right to the questions. But the, the audience uh, participants are really grateful uh, that, that you're here with us. So uh, another question here is, um, how, has this, how has scholar activism influenced policymaking um, in the context of social movements? Or another way of putting that, they said, how will scholarly activism, I'm sorry, another part of the question is, how does scholar activism shape graduate programs? I mean, certainly they're two different things. Um, yeah. One is the shaping of graduate programs. The other is shaping, let's say, you know, the world or, or policy yes. or whatever. It's not that graduate programs are not in the world. I, I don't mean that at all, but they're sense. different scales. They're different scales. Um, let's just stay with the graduate programs Nadine, and not go in the other one. It's the other one is much broader and so on. Um, you know, the United States has a vulner vulner venerable history uh, of student activism, student militancy, generating ideas. Uh, of course, we know this is the origin of women's studies. This is the origin of ethnic studies. This is the origin of LGBT studies, queer studies, and so on. Uh, these forms of, of, of uh, intellectual inquiry were not gifts of a liberal administration. Um, you know, uh, this is not because one day some college professor woke up and said, oh, my God, I, we need to think about, you know, race more effectively. Uh, no, this is, you know, student uh, demonstrating and saying that, you know, there's no uh, better understanding of race and society and so on. So there is that there is a history of students shaping uh, thought in the American Academy. But there also we should be very aware of the fact there's a history of cooptation and the way in which they take things in. Um, I mean, very early in my writing, I wrote a book about what multiculturalism does. Uh, you know, the book was called Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting. And in the front part of the book, there was an argument against multiculturalism because part of the argument being made was that this discourse of multiculturalism that had emerged was overwhelming the discourse of anti-racism or essentially dignity claims. You know, um, the uprisings of, on the flanks of, of race or gender or sexuality, they, they were making dignity claims. They were not making claims for acceptance. It's a big difference, not for being to tolerated, but claims of dignity. Tolerance is a very dangerous term because you don't want to be tolerated. You want to be a human being. And so uh, these forms in which universities suck the life out of 
um, you know, uh, these dignity demands and the anti-capitalist demands at the heart of these movements, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, gay liberation uh, has an anti-capitalist side to it. Uh, gay liberation wasn't about, you know, having, um, uh, you know, diversity on corporate boards and so on. So there was a way of diversity in the military. You know, we want to serve as well. We want to also be in the military to kill people in Vietnam and then later in Iraq and then God knows where all, you know, everywhere, uh, Syria and let's go kill people. We want the right to kill. You know, women want the right to be the front lines of the U.S. military so they can kill Venezuelans and, you know, I mean, it's an abhorrent way of thinking, you know, this inclusivity, tolerance attitude. But all these movements had a strong anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist side to them, you know, and they were the ones that shaped these departments and programs. And it's a god awful shame that today you'll have women's studies programs, you'll have ethnic studies programs, you'll have black studies programs that are utterly complicit in U.S. imperialism, you know, totally complicit. It's a god awful shame. They're just laughing at the students you know, whose battle produced these departments. And, you know, you can go beyond that. Sociology. See, I haven't read C. Wright Mills, but I've read Du Bois, a lot of Du Bois. You know, Du Bois was a founder of American sociology. And so much American sociology is so god-awfully racist. You know, I mean, your founder is one of the men with the most glorious imagination for human freedom. You know, Du Bois imagined human freedom, the capacity of human beings to change things. And these number counters, these pathetic examples of thinking, they can't visualize the next horizon. All they want to do is go outside and count numbers. I mean, God, this is the tradition of Du Bois. I mean, what are you doing? Even in political science, you know, Ralph Bunch, you know, there's your founder of, of American international relations. International relations, Vitalis's book, you know, shows it comes out of so-called race relations. It's a racist history. Ralph Bunch comes in there, you know, they try. It's a racist history, totally unreconstructed. And you get these racist attempts to understand the world. You know, political scientists talking about, well, these countries, they failed states and so on. Oh, my God, you have a failed state. You have a failed state. You, you have hunger in the United States. 40% of your people are hungry. Your state is failed. Don't you dare go and point a finger at Zambia and say, oh, that's a failed state. Or Mozambique, that's a failed state. It may have a lot of failures. I agree. But good God, man, who's going to take you seriously? Your credibility is zero. Unfortunately, their credibility is not zero. That's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, the, um, the white man's burden <laughs> problems. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, challenging us on how the pointing the finger issue, right, before looking in our own backyard. I mean, that just seems like step one <laughs> to thinking about global solidarity and global research and activism. Uh, so let's go to the next question, which comes from a Palestinian postdoctoral researcher who is using their research in the aid of their community. And they are wondering if you have advice from your personal experience for especially junior scholars who want to create ethical research agendas and who don't want to sell their soul to institutions, sorry, and who want to start their own program initiatives that have a global network and commitment? I just, it's too much responsibility to answer this question. Um, <laughs> no, it is. I, I'm, I'm not saying it glibly. This is an actual human being who is asking an actual question about how do I build my career? And I don't know you. And I think it's wrong for me to, to say anything because I don't know you. I don't know your, I don't know what your needs are. I don't know you know, whether you have means and I don't know these things. I just can't, uh, you know, uh, these are very intimate and personal questions about people's ability to make certain choices. I think it's very wrong to just say, oh, you should do this, you should do that. You know, I mean, look, the, what is the method I'm saying? You have to go and first find out what people are thinking and what their praxis is capable of. And then you elaborate the contradictory consciousness into philosophy. It would be a complete 
violation of our own research ethic for me to pronounce philosophically about somebody's life when I don't know anything about them. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, we can all reflect back on the model that you've shared and then think of how to make it specific for each person's situation. So I really appreciate that. And, and also the way that you've answered the question so honestly and ethically. So thank you for that. Uh, so the next question is about elections. So what do you think the role of elections are in relation to workers' movements? And what are some important steps workers' movements should be taking at this moment? Um, I mean, okay, so Nadine, you know, when people say elections in the United States, they often think about November and the American election. It's always haunting the conversation. I mean, the question of elections depends on which country we're talking about. You know, so for instance, in Venezuela, there'll be an election in December. This is a very important election because the National Assembly is controlled by, you know, the opposition. And some of it is the US-backed regime change opposition. So it's a very important election in, in December, on December 6th. In Zambia next year, the, there is an election against a, a government which is appalling. And the front runner of the opposition is Fred Mbembe, who is the leader of the Socialist Party of Zambia. Fred was a newspaper publisher. He's fighting a campaign in the, in the Copper Belt. Recently, um, the leader of their party, Cosmos Musaveli, was arrested put in prison, detained, uh, there an election has a certain consequential weight. They are using the election to go to the people and to put forward an alternative, a real genuine socialist alternative. So that's in those places, there's elections and those are real guys. Like that's, for, you know, that's a real thing. The United States, what election? The Voting Rights Act doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, you have one party that is a total authoritarian nonsense, illogical party, which captures, I don't know, 38, 40%, 42% of the vote. That's the Republican Party. Then you have the Democratic Party, the great betrayer of people's hopes, um, consistently a betrayer, constantly tells people that, sorry, we can't go as far as you want. And so we'll only go halfway. And halfway suddenly becomes basically what the other side want, because we are bipartisan, unlike them. Uh, they hold fast to their principles, but we are bipartisan, which means basically surrenderists. So what election in the US? Uh, now, I'm not saying voting out Trump is not important. It's in the United States, it's very important. If you are a poor person in the United States, let's say if you're a poor person in Chicago, I think it makes a difference if Biden is in the White House or if Trump is in the White House. It may make a difference for the certain things. If you are a woman in Barcasimento in Venezuela, it makes no difference whether it's Trump or it's Biden, because both of them want to destroy your life. So it always depends when you say what about elections and so on, what country are you talking about? And then from what class perspective, what national perspective, you know, do you think it matters, you know, Nadine, for an Iranian? Um, if Biden is the president or if, uh, do you think it matters for the Palestinians? I don't think so. I think, yes, Trump puts his foot much harder on the neck of Palestine, but Biden is not going to lift that foot off the neck. You know, they're going to keep it there. They will allow a little more air to go. So yeah, are you going to make a big deal because they allow a little more oxygen into the lungs? Okay, that's up to you. Thank you so much. Um... I mean, I was thinking actually that in the case of Palestine, I, I agree, but I was thinking of places like Egypt or, you know, where you have this authoritarian, you know, methods of the, the counterinsurgency repression. I, I do wonder if you think that President Trump, you know, in, in a more significant way enables, you know, people like Sisi um, in ways that maybe a Biden wouldn't or to the extent at least that, that does make a difference. The repression and the absolute, you know, state violence with impunity and everything, you know, torture, censorship, uh, murders. Well, Mubarak was in power for 29 years. Um, while Hosni Mubarak was in power, That's Clinton true. was in office. Right, right, right. 
Obama was in office. Then when the people went to Tahrir, and not only Tahrir, when in Mahalla they were protesting in Port Said, in Alexandria, you know, all across the country, Hillary Clinton sends Frank Wisner carrying the classic Frank Wisner suitcase, Jr. Frank Wisner Jr.'s father was a CIA agent. Frank Wisner Jr. arrives in uh, Egypt, sees Mubarak, and tells him, just make some concessions. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Obama. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, he, so, I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying point. from the standpoint yeah. of an ordinary person. That's a good you know, point. Yeah, I mean, from the standpoint of our friends who are in prison in Cairo, for instance, it may make a difference. It may, because Biden might have to have some human rights type record. So some of our friends who are in prison in Cairo, for their sake, I hope it's, that some pressure is put on CC and he releases them and then they can leave the country because they, they cannot move a political agenda under this. Not like that. So <laughs> I see what, what are we saying, talking? That, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that that's fair enough. And yeah, Obama proposed Omar Sleiman as the next president after Mubarak. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, okay. Another question here is, uh, we have several questions. We have about, you know, 15 minutes or so, if you're okay with that, Dr. Prashad. Please, please, please. Okay. Um, so we have a question about uh, contradictory consciousness. Um, how would you analyze state-sponsored Islamic preachers in Arab nations who use the Israeli invasion of 1967 as a way to increase social regulations and diminish civil liberties in their own countries? Well, um, I've written two books that talk about this at great length, so I, I might just try to sell a few books now, if that's okay. Uh, um, in, uh, <laughs> in Darker Nations, there's a chapter called Mecca. And then I wrote a book called The Death of the Nation, you know, the Arab Revolution and uh, the Death of the Nation and the Future of the Arab Revolution. Uh, which develops this a little bit. And the point there is that in the 1960s, um, Saudi Arabia, which was feeling greatly threatened by the rise of Nasserism, greatly threatened by Nasserism, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, in collaboration with the CIA and so on, um, created this World Muslim League. Now, I just published a book called Washington Bullets, which has a, a section with a find that I couldn't believe I found, which is a document written by a Chinese Muslim um, in, in Taiwan, sends this to uh, the US State Department saying, we need to set up a um, Muslim organization, global. This is before the World Muslim League, a global Muslim organization. He's writing in the 50s to undercut communism. He says, liberalism cannot undercut communism because liberalism doesn't deal with hunger and, and the real issues that the communists deal with. So the communists outflank liberalism on the battle of ideas there. But he says, how we can defeat communism is by inflaming religion. And he said, Islam is the key one. He said, because if you look at the geography of the USSR from Dagestan down to um, Central Asian republics and then up into Xinjiang and parts of um, Mongolia, just to the edge, you have a large belt of Muslims. And he said, we need to use Islam to break these populations and to break up the USSR and China. It's an incredible memo. So in this book I've just published called Washington Bullets, I quote almost the whole memo. Now, in 60s, when the Saudis create this group, they've spent a ton of money exporting their version of Islam. This includes the building of mosques. I mean, in Aleppo, which was a highly cosmopolitan society, highly cosmopolitan society, from the 70s onwards, uh, Saudi mosques were built in working class areas and uh, Syrian preachers came to study Islam in Saudi Arabia and went back. Many of them became the emirs, the, 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 the sort of uh, religious advisors of the Al-Qaeda groups that grew up in Syria during the uprising. And they emerge out of the Saudi fingers, the tentacles across the, this region. So look at the rise of Hamas, for instance. You know, uh, Hamas was unknown 
in Palestine. I mean, it was the popular front for the liberation of Palestine. It was Fatah. It was a democratic front. It was, you know, a range of left-wing communist organizations. And the Israelis colluding with the CIA and with the Gulf Arabs, who you know, they never gave two hoots about the Palestinians. I was very surprised to see people surprised about the UAE's decision regarding Israel. How are you surprised? These people are scoundrels, you know, they are scoundrels. So all these people, the Kuwaitis and others, uh, who have used Palestinian skilled labor for generations, uh, all these people basically came together and they create these organizations. Now, it's okay, you can call me a conspiracy theorist. I'll take it on the chin, uh, but I'm not because guess what? There are documents where they go over this and they tell you, this is what we're doing. It's State Department documents. It's not out of my head. They are saying this, and then you see what they've done in the world. Then you turn around and say, look, there's a malignancy in Islam. I don't think so. I don't think this is an Islam problem. I think this is a Saudi Arabia imperialism issue. This is not about, if I, if I criticize this, I'm not Islamophobic, guys. I'm a critic of the Saudi monarchy and its close association with US imperialism, the CIA and the Israelis. That's the problem here. And so when one talks about, you know, the uh, Arab preachers after the 67 war, I would say, wait a minute, you're dating it too late. It's actually not the 67 war. It's the creation of the World Muslim League in 1962 uh, that starts to have an impact in the 70s. And it's interesting that when you look at the World Muslim, Muslim League, everywhere where they had branch offices, but I'm just saying something silly, this is not uh, important, but silly, everywhere where they had branch offices, Al-Qaeda recruited from all those countries. So when you look at the Al-Qaeda nationalities list from Philippines to Dagestan, it's all the World Muslim <laughs> League offices. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the contradictions, right? <laughs> Um, so we, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I want to comment, but I'm not going to, so we can get to the next question. Please uh, comment, please oh, no. comment. Thank you so much. Let's just do the next question, then we'll okay. see, because we, we want to hear from you, really. But that was extremely helpful. I mean, it was very nuanced and gave us, you know, the historical conditions out of which these, you know, even the idea of uh, Muslims, et cetera, emerged. So thank you for that. Um, challenge. Uh, so we can look to a question about, um, we'll have two questions here. I'm just trying to think. Uh, there is a, so I'll just tell you both and you can mm. take it in whatever direction. There's a question about Gramsci and uh, the United States, uh, um, how the left in the United States has largely ignored or maybe not been strategic around the struggle around ideology at a time when the right has successfully shaped and controlled the discussions around so many topics, as you know, family, et cetera, government taxes, um, and then, uh, and also in supporting Donald Trump. Admittedly, their efforts are well-funded, um, but they are hegemonic, um, is, and there's not enough discussion about counter-hegemonic strategy, ideology, et cetera. So that's one question. Mm -hmm. The second question is about tricontinental and how it's been effective in connecting ideas and practices of social movements and bringing them to a broader audience. If the academy is not likely to do the same, um, does this moment of social media represent an opportunity for the growth of international solidarity work? Let me do the second one and come back to the US because the second is important. I, I, I want to say that it's not that Tricontinental has done X, Y, Z. You know, we are part of a, a, of a very large network uh, of over 200 organizations spread out over 100 countries, they are already in communication with each other. You know, I'm talking about the landless workers in, in Brazil, MST. I'm talking about the Socialist Party in Zambia. I'm talking about the Workers' Party in Tunisia uh, and so on. You know, uh, and then we can go into Asia. And I mean, they're already in communication and they have networks and, and so on. We are just part of the world, um, you know, Patria Grande in Argentina. That's where our almost our entire team is born out of the Patria Grande dynamic, you know. Um, and so uh, I don't think it's right to say that we have done, that's a cart in the horse. I mean, we are just part of a, of a long process and, and movement and, and we're developing our ideas alongside the movements and so on. Um, 
so I don't think social media for us is how it happens because it's through political trust. And this is what I wanted to say is that the pandemic has created problems because political trust cannot be built um, without deep ideological conversations across boundaries and languages with people and serious, severe engagement where people are, you know, trying to argue with each other about political lines without trying to influence each other's political opinions. Because, you know, if I'm in an organization, my political line is built dem democratically in my organization. So when two organizations meet, they can exchange ideas, but they can't tell each other that you are wrong. You know, that if you have that attitude, you don't build political trust. So you're engaging. That's why I like the word you engage with each other. You learn from each other. What is your assessment? This is our assessment. And then how can we collaborate where we agree? You know, and then where we agree, we don't know something. Ah, okay, let's see if they can research something to help us understand. So that's where we come in. You know, we are very much engaged at that level um, of, of, but so social movement is like a billboard, Nadine. When you are driving in Chicago and you pass a billboard, uh, you glance up and you see, you know, something, an advertisement for something. We understand social media like that. It's a billboard, which is a good function in a, in a democratic society. You know, talks are useful. Uh, they help people understand your perspective. But you can't build political trust without those deep, private, serious conversations. They're private because two people, two organizations should be able to talk to each other without risk of you know, it being broadcast outside, you know, and somebody maliciously saying, oh, they said this here, they said that there, you need to have that. It's, it's not easy. I mean, the left is in a huge disadvantage in the pandemic because, you know, the right, I mean, what's there to talk about amongst them? You know, they agree on so much infra, the underneath agreement is so deep. Uh, they are such, they have such a wretched agenda hateful agenda. This is not much to discuss. They hate people. I mean, I mean it. They, they just, they have no compassion for people. I mean, look at Trump, you know, he's the most uncompassionate person, you know. I mean, when he says things casually, I watched a clip where he's saying things like science doesn't always know everything. I mean, yes, of course, that's true. You know, scientists will tell you that the investigation of ideas is incomplete. They don't claim to be God, but he's saying it to disparage scientific thinking, not to make a truth claim about how scientists believe that scientific inquiry is unfinished. You know, it's a very malicious attitude. And that malicious attitude has a cost. Thousands of people being killed by a virus that you're not allowing scientific procedures to help contain. You know, they are not compassionate people. We, we need political trust. They just bond on masculinity. Thank you so much. Did you wanna, we have five minutes left. So if you wanted to wrap it up with one more minute, um, please do, up to you. Well, this is very kind of you. I, I would love to, firstly, I, I want to say again, Nadine, it's great to be with you. Uh, it's great to be um, with you because you are a, you know, looking at these things seriously. I mean, I hope very much the Institute is going to, um, you know, challenge itself always. I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do, Nadine? We, okay. we don't sit around and say, look, we're doing great. I mean, we're always saying, I think we're wrong. Um, we're not growing if we're not, uh, you know, doubtful about what we're doing. And I know academics and intellectuals are extraordinarily neurotic. So mm -hmm. I don't mean uh, doubt in a neurotic way, but in a serious sort of way. And I, I know that the Institute will, is doing great and will do even better. Um, I also know that, I mean, these are very difficult times. Um, there is this wretched election. And in the United States, uh, during election season, everything else is supposed to fall in line. A uh, real tragedy. And, you know, there's horrible, horrible uh, police violence in the US. And, and the feeling that emerged out of it of defund the police is such a important, maybe the slogan was confusing for some people, but it's such an important gesture about priorities. You know, I always say, Nadine, that in my opinion, um, you don't test the morality of a country based on its constitution. You test the morality of, its con of a country based on its, con on its budget. Uh, you see, in the constitution, you can have all kinds of high-minded things, but if your budget shows 
that you're spending more on destruction than on taking care of people. That's your morality, guys. You know, United States government, you spend way more on your military and your policing and so on. Therefore, you are a militaristic, repressive. That's your morality. You're militaristic and repressive. You can't tell me we believe in freedom and look at the Constitution. That's smoke and mirrors. Your morality has got to be judged by how you spend your people's wealth. And I think the American government comes off badly. So, I mean, that whole defund the police thing was, I think, trying to demonstrate this, to show this. Um, and I think it's so important and it's going to be forgotten, you know, because this is what they do. They come in, police officers will start to take a knee. Uh, they'll all carry Black Lives Matter signs. And then when the budgetary process opens up again, they'll overfund the police departments. They'll overfund the military. They'll have a new you know, aircraft carrier and so on, but they won't have hospitals for the poor. They won't have food for the poor. They won't have the capacity uh, for schooling to open again so that, you know, mainly mothers are not having to sit next to their children with screens and help them. Uh, they don't provide free Wi-Fi. They don't provide free computers to every child so that they can do this ridiculous digital education. You know, they don't provide any of this. They'll put their money into war, into militarism. Uh, this is a question of the morality of a country. You know, when King and others said that the soul of the United States is in question, I honestly don't think he was talking as a clergyman. He was talking as a human being. Uh, that's not a that is not language I restrict to religion. When, when one says that, you know, the soul of a country is in doubt, um, it's because you're spending more on destroying the world than building it. And, you know, and we and people need to be in the battle of ideas. The, the first question in the battle of ideas. We need to be aggressive about that in our own non-aggressive way. Uh, we need to be clear about this. We need to talk about the fact that the country has lost its way. You know, it's it's a it's in moral it's in a moral quicksand. It's sinking fast. You remember King's line, you know, when it's darkest outside, then you can see the stars. When it's darkest outside, then you can see the stars. And if I look outside in the American sky, it's really dark. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm Thanks. just going to, really, that was so powerful. I'm just going to close out the event by um, really just, you know, one minute to just, I, I appreciated every word you said, and I especially appreciated this, what I was hearing throughout your entire talk about when you just said about the stars. Um, what I really appreciated throughout the whole talk is challenging the scarcity model around scholar activism or activist scholarship that, you know, we can't because they're targeting us or we can't because I, I won't get tenure, but instead we're not going back to the status quo anymore um, it doesn't look that way. And so what are we building? What are we going to do? What will the nature of activist scholarship be? And we, we have to be creative. And that's what you've done. That's what you've inspired us around. Um, and in doing it in ways that are organic, that are based on mutual trust, respect, accountability. And just you've really opened us up to the many possibilities for how scholarship and movements mutually constitute each other at a time when we may no longer have the option of disengaging or even thinking about our work as isolated in an ivory tower or isolated from the world. So thank you, thank you. And thank you to um, Thamal and Ash. Thank you to uh, Dr. Todd Breland, to our captioner, interpreter. Special thanks to Yvonne from IRRPP and to each and every audience member, participant for joining us. And even though we couldn't see you, we know that you're here and, you know, the, the event would be nothing without each and every person who showed up. Uh, so thank you all. Continue to follow the work of IRRPP. We're doing an entire year on social movement led research and just greatest gratitude and deep thanks to Dr. Prashad for yes, joining us. So much honor and to your mother, to your you know, all to try continental to all the movements that you're connected to. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.